left. You want to tell somebody beside you, there's a miracle in what I have left. So this particular story is very familiar. We've heard it preached in many ways. Um, and no doubt, many of us can relate to this woman. Everyone in this room has experienced some kind of loss in their lives. Life events are sure to guarantee it. You can, uh, and sometimes it just looks like there's not enough left. Uh, for example, if you look at your paycheck after you pay your bills, you can say there's not enough left. It seems like it's just not enough. And life has dealt with you in a kind of way, like this woman in our text, but it seems there's very little left. And so what I want to deal with is just the perspective of the woman. Uh, we a lot of times heard the sermon preached where they focused on the, the, the jugs and the oil not failing and, and God worked a miracle and how God used Elijah, but the woman is not much focused on. And so today, I would like to focus on her. First of all, the woman, she was a widow. So she had great losses. And so what you need to understand that in the Bible days, a widow was different than what a widow is now. Uh, being a widow in the Bible days was tough. Uh, it was nothing like today. So it's considered social and economically a tragedy when you are a widow. Because the main source of your income and support had perished. Uh, as a widow, you had minimal rights to inheritance of, of the husband. And if the family was gracious enough, they may let you have something. But that wasn't always the case. And the ties with the family of the husband, a lot of times, was severed. And so, she was out of luck. Or, now, if by chance things worked in her favor, the law permitted, if she was still young, and if she was without child, and if, there's a lot of ifs, if she was still able to produce the closest male family member, usually the brother-in-law, would marry her to produce offspring to carry the, the husband's legacy. So in generally a patriarchal society, the death of a husband was a type of cultural death because the social context of the word just meant that she lived in extreme poverty. Widows wore garments that even indicated their status. It just was like a sign on their back saying, I am poor. Yeah, yeah. So this included loss of dignity, loss of self-esteem, loss of pride. Self-worth was not even um, on the scale. And so in her, this woman's state of mind, she had made up her mind that she was going to stop existing. So the it was, it was, so she, she made up in her mind that this was it. The Bible says that she said, I'm going to make this for my son and myself, and we're going to die. Yeah. Because she realized that what she had was not enough for her future. But tell your neighbor, there's a miracle in what I have left. Yeah. Just like the song said, the, the group Journey sang a song, Don't Stop Believing. And so our focus today is going to be more so not on what we lost, but what we have left. And so my question is to you, what is it that you lost? Like this woman, we've experienced great losses. Some of us have lost relationships. We've lost people um, that gave us, you know, gave us a sense of security. You know, our friends, you know, our cut buddies, you know, they, they all of a sudden they're gone. And some of our jobs gave us pink slips. And some of us had cars were repoed and made bad credit decisions and family members turn their backs yeah, on us and yeah, yeah. some of us get sickness and illnesses that cause, rendered us somewhat unable to do what we normally like to do. Some of us have had loved ones who were close to us that have passed on and, and that left us feeling like there was nothing left. Yeah. I, I can say for myself, I remember my grandmother passed away and I felt like yeah. everything came to a stop. Then I felt like there was nothing else to live for. I remember walking the streets of Charlotte, downtown Charlotte, bawling and crying my eyes out and didn't care. And people were looking at me and wondering, and I felt like as if I was lost my mind. 
that I felt that there was nothing left. You know, friends walked out of your life and, and then go, you know, boo and pay and behave it right. And then, then you've got, you know, things that you built life and, and, and had to walk away empty handed after you invested yeah. and put so much in and poured in and took time and nurtured. You had to walk away empty handed. And then the dog bit you and the cat scratched you. Both of them just turned on. And so we, it, it, life makes you feel like, what is there left? We often, often ask ourselves the question, what else can go wrong? And so this woman, you can imagine in her mind, her, her state of mind was just, she's thinking that this is it. There's nothing else to live for. But tap your name and say, change your outlook. And so the purpose of Elijah coming to this woman was not so much that, yes, God made a provision for him through her, but it was also for her as well. Because she needed somebody to change her outlook. You know how sometimes in the, in the horror movies when they're running from, from the axe murderer and, and they hide in the closet, and then you got one person just flipping out, flipping out, flipping out, and then all of a sudden they, the other person just hauls and slap them? Get it together. Because we're not going to die here. And so this encounter with this woman was just that slap in the face that she needed. Yeah, right. Because God has something else in mind. Yeah. And so here, uh, she, re she received instruction from the prophet to do something with she had, what she had left. Right. Then he commanded her not to fear. Yeah. Commanded not to see fear has to be a choice. And I know a lot of times it doesn't seem that way. Because your body starts going into reactions and creating anxiety and start producing more of adrenaline than your body can, can handle. And so your heart is beating fast and then your mind is your thoughts are just going far from you. You can't seem to get it back. But he said, Don't fear. Yeah. Yeah. Don't fear. And the reason why it was important for her not to fear because he needs to understand God has something in his, up his sleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. You want to tell somebody, God's got something up his sleeve. <laughs> Don't you just love God? He's got something. He's always got something up his sleeve. And, and so, so our praise should be continued because no matter what we go through, God's got something up his sleeve. And so, what God's saying to us through this is that God does not want us to lose sight of our future, but to focus on what we need to do now. So she had, she was taking what she had and was comparing it to what God had in store. And it didn't match up. Yeah. But here's the secret, it's not supposed to. Because where you're going is so much greater than where you are now. So you can't compare it to what, what, what God showed you because it's, it's, not even, it's not even for that time. What you have right now is not for that time. And so I come to realize God likes to use what's left. If you don't believe me, let's, let's just look at a few witnesses. Let's take Moses, for example. Moses, uh, he grew up, uh, he was born in Hebrew, but grew up in Pharaoh's house. And so he had everything that he could ever want. He had food and clothes and probably women and, and, and just whatever he wanted to do and however he wanted to do it, he had it all. And then, as we know the story goes, he ends up down to nothing but a rod in his hand and a bunch of children of Israel. Didn't seem like nothing left. And so when God sends them and, and sends them to the Exodus and they get to the Red Sea, the children of Israel begin to complain. They said, Moses, now there was not enough graves in Egypt. You had to bring us out here to die. And so, so God told Moses, he said, oh, I love God, because he speaks to you in these times. And so, so he cried unto God, and the Lord said to him, Moses, why are you crying to me? He said, what, use what you have in your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Didn't seem like much, but right. that rod, he said, stretch it across the water and tell the children of Israel to go forward. And so that was when God decided to use what Moses had left 
Because if he had, he had everything else, he, he could have used, he made, could have bargained. If he had money, he could have bargained with Pharaoh and said, you know, okay, but, all right, you know, my bad, my pay. We were just playing. We were just joking. Just, you know, okay, how much do you want? How much do you want? We can pay you. We can settle this right now. If he, if he had charity, if he had weapons, he could have maybe tried to fight with them a little bit, maybe. Uh, it's possible, but then there was nothing left but a rock. God likes to use what you have left. And now, 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 next witness, uh, the woman with the issue of blood. Now, she had this condition 12 years. 12 long years. And, and, and in those days, when a woman had her cycle, she was not allowed to be in the general public. She had to be way off on the way somewhere in seclusion. So imagine 12 years being in solitary confinement. And, and the Bible says that she spent all of that she had and was not made better, but in fact made worse. She had nothing left. But what she had left was faith and determination. Somehow or another in her seclusion, she heard about Jesus. And so she made it her business to make her way through the press of the crowd. No matter what the law said, she pressed her way. And because of her faith, her faith, she received her healing. But she had nothing. It was because she had nothing left. Because had she had money, she still would have been seeking physicians and, and seeking magicians to try to fix her remedy. But you see, God had to let her get down to where there was nothing left. So, 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 now here's what we need to understand. If we lost it, then we didn't need it for our survival. Because the promise of God is that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so, if we need it for our survival, trust me, we would have it. But here now, I hear the words of Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. So blessed be the name of the Lord. Because if the Lord knew that I needed it, he would not have taken it. So what is God saying to us? No matter what we have left, there's a miracle. That's where your miracle is. And some of us, God gave us an idea. We have nothing left but an idea. Some of us, we have nothing but a skill and a talent. That's what you use. And then, if, if, if you're nothing else, nothing else, we've got Jesus. So, so he said, now, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so I'm a witness that if you have Jesus and lost everything else, you've got enough. More than enough to start again. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't know that, you need to understand that Jesus is really all that you need. And so because we got Jesus, you know, he gave us prayer. And prayer is how we talk to God and God talks to us. And we make our requests known to him. And we know by experience alone that God is a prayer answering God. Somebody ought to lift their hands and praise God for being a prayer answering God. Because some of us, we were in trouble with God. And we cried unto God and we prayed and God answered us. And he made a way. He opened the door. And some of us, God had to, God even kicked the wall in and told us to walk through the wall. Through the wall. So God has a way of just doing just that. And so now we got his promises. And his promises are yea and amen. And so God, the Bible tells us that God is not a son of God, not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. And if he spoke it, he will make it good. And so we got his promises that he, number one, that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And, and what I like about it is that he never leave us means he's going to always be there. But he said, I'll never forsake you, which means he's not just going to stand there and watch you go through your trouble. He's going to, he's going to help you. We have people who saw our trouble, saw our need, and walked away. They, they didn't, couldn't help us. They didn't, some, of us didn't, some of them didn't want to help us. But, so, but God said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Clap your hands and thank God right now. Thank you, God. And then we've got faith. The Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That there is nothing impossible to them. That believe, and, and going back to the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus addressed her and said, according to your, because of your faith, you have been made whole. It was according to your faith, so as long as we have faith, that's why the enemy tried to attack our faith, because he knows that if we have faith in God, then God can do the impossible. Jesus said, if you just have a, a faith the size of a mustard seed, you didn't need much. It didn't need much at all. If you know what a mustard seed looks like, it's very small. It doesn't look like it's much, but the Bible says that when you when you plant a mustard seed, it grows into a great tree. And so here's what we need to understand. 
Faith is all you need. That's why you need to guard your faith and keep building yourself on your most holy faith because because that's what we need. And so that's all that's all we got left. And then there's praise. Oh, this is my favorite because they the praise brings an atmosphere that is conducive to miracles. Tell your neighbor again, remind them there's a miracle of what I have left. And I'm a witness that there were times all I had was a praise. Didn't have two nickels to rub together. Didn't have a head and cheese sandwich. Didn't have, didn't have heat. Didn't have water. Now all I had was a praise. That's why you gotta keep your praise. I don't care what you're going through. You got to keep your praise. Because guess what? Praise will bring God to you. The Bible tells us that he inhabits the praise of his people. And so if he inhabits my praise, then that means the miracle worker himself is in the mix. And whatever miracle I need, he's right there to make it happen. Always tell somebody, keep your praise, keep your praise. You can have the money. Give me my praise. You can have the job, just give me my praise. You can have the car, just give me my praise. You, you can keep the phrase, I just give you my praise. Oh God, if anyone want to act up, that's all right. God, I got my praise. Thank God for my praise. Because I remember when all I had was a praise. But I'm here to tell you that God's got a way. He's got a way to work your praise. Now praise him. What is it that you got left? Now praise him. 
come out of last year. You got to, there's a miracle in it. There's a miracle in it. There is a miracle in it. Bless him. There's a miracle in it. He's gonna blow your mind. Come on and bless him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's a miracle in what you got left. 